Welcome to Duck Season Somewhere Podcast. This episode is brought to you by the following sponsors. GetDucks.com, your proven source for the very best waterfowl hunting adventures. Argentina, Mexico, six whole continents worth. For two decades, we've delivered real duck hunts for real duck hunters. And ushuntlist.com because the next great hunt is closer than you think. Search our database of proven U.S. and Canadian outfits. Contact them directly with confidence. Trust is earned. By the numbers, 121 waterfowl subspecies bagged on six continents, 20 countries, 36 U.S. states, and growing. I spend upwards of 225 days per year chasing ducks, geese, and swans worldwide. And I don't choose shotguns for their brand name or the cool factor. Y'all know me way better than that. I've shot Benelli for over two decades. I continue shooting Benelli shotguns for their simplicity, utter reliability, and superior performance. Whether hunting near home or halfway across the world, that is the stuff that matters. Ball Shot Shell's copper-plated bismuth tin alloy is the good old days again. Steel shots come a long way in the past 30 years, but will never, ever perform like good old-fashioned lead. Say goodbye to all that gimmicky, high-recoil, compensation, science, hype, and hello to superior performance. Know your pattern. Take ethical shots. Make clean kills. That is the boss way. The good old days are now. It really is duck season somewhere for 365 days from here. Duck season somewhere takes me year-round to worldwide destinations where I visit with the most interesting people. I'm your host, Ramsey Russell. Join me here to listen to those conversations. That's the thing we read. That's it, ain't it? That's the old style. Folks, welcome back. I'm I'm down here in Louisiana. Round two with Mr. Dale Bordland of Boyles Parish, Louisiana. Talking about the old ways down in Louisiana. We'll start this show off telling y'all this. Years ago, uh, my first podcast ever was Rocky LaFleur. I talked about my upbringings, my childhood in Greenville, Mississippi. And one of the things I did, you know, so I guess some people picked up tin cans. I did, and I caught snapping turtles, little old bitty snapping turtles, you know, five, ten pounds. And uh, I would sell them at the fish market for 40 cents a pound. And look, man, for a eight, nine, ten-year-old kid, I was rich, man. 20 bucks a week catching turtles, I, I thought I'd done something. And my hero, my hero back in those days was a man named Snapper from uh, uh, there in Greenville, Mississippi. And uh, the old man was missing a thumb because he used to catch him big turtles back in them oxbows. He'd catch him big old turtles. And wrestle him down in a croaker sack, and he was making real money selling them things back in the day. And that, that was my childhood hero. Um, I hunted with Dale Forrest, and I did a couple of years ago. And when we were there, he had a lot of these turtle shells and a lot of these great big snapping turtle heads. And I'm talking big as a Folgers coffee can snapping turtle heads. And uh, I just thought that'd be a good topic. Uh, I don't know, a couple of months ago, right about the start of COVID. I got a call from a client. This client's been all over the world hunting all kinds of critters. He said, man, I need, I, need, I need some help. I said, what do you need? He says, I need you to help me find somebody that hunts them big snapping turtles. I said, well, I know who I'm going to call. He goes, who? I said, my buddy Dale Bordland. Dale, you know a little bit about these turtles, don't you? Well, I've been, yeah, my daddy used to catch them, and I've been fooling with them most of my life. When I was about 17 years old, they used to have a supper once a week at the old camp, and we eat a lot of turtle. People from Louisiana eat a lot of turtle. And I used to trap turtles. I had some cages. Now, this was mostly, mostly common snappers, and occasionally I caught loghead turtles. What's the difference? The common snapper don't get more than about, I say, an average of 25, 30 pounds. That's a big turtle. Mostly around 10, 15 pounds. Very, very edible. Very, very good eating. The uh, alligator snapping turtle, which we call loggerheads, <clears throat> oh, man, they get, I know a fella has one 200 pounds. But in a the while, they get, I guess, 150 pounds pushing the biggest. My goodness. They get real big. Big. I've, I've caught several over 100 pounds. 
How but, would you catch those? When you say a trap, how were you catching them? Well, I had a wire trap. That old hog, two by four square hog wire, the old hog wire, it was tired wire. Not the ones you get now because they're not durable no more. It, this is the old, when they used to make the old fences, we make a square trap, like four feet long, two and a half, three feet wide. We, they had a big flue in the middle, long, wide as a trap, and a door, you know, with, on top where you put, get the turtles out. And I'd, I'd use fish and I'd put them, I'd put the, the uh, some of it sticking out, some under the water. If you got alligators, you got to put it under the water. Alligator's not going to get in there for the majority of the time. If you put it out the water, he'll get in there and tie a trap up. And uh, I used to put that all over them bodies around where I was raised. And I had a freezer full of meat. I had an old scale from the Piggly Wiggly store. A friend of mine worked that gave me. One of those spring scales. I used to clean them turtles and weigh them and freeze them. And I'd sell them. Whoever wanted turtles, I'd sell them. I had a big supply for us. We made this big supper with these old men and, and people did that back then a lot. The how would y'all, how would y'all, how do you even clean a turtle like that? I, I used to sell them when I was a child, but I don't think I ever cleaned one. I'm going to tell you the best thing I'll find, you shoot them in the head with a 22. If you kill a turtle and start cleaning it, he'll claw you for hours. The, the, the nerves, they just keep trying to get you. What I do, I shoot them in the head with a 22, and I throw them in the ice chest on ice. The next day, I clean them. Oh. They don't, they, they're dead. Then. There's no more nerves. And the first thing I do, I cut the feet off with a sharp knife, and I just follow the shell with a good sharp knife around. I just hold them out. It's not hard to do. Uh, and somebody told me one time that there were seven kinds of meat in a big old turtle like that. I've heard that all my life. Yeah. Russ, I'm going to tell you. I've been cleaning a lot of turtles. I caught a lot of turtles. If you catch a loggerhead, I'll get a snapping turtle. If he's twenty, if he's about thirty pounds on up, what I do is I I core him, take the meat out with the bone, cut the neck off. There's a the neck is all white meat, a lot of meat on it. But you get go by a sink, get you a good comfortable place and sit down. You can fillet all that meat off of that bone. You won't lose nothing. Versus trying to cut that big bone. Yeah. I, if he's 50 pounds, 80 pounds, you debone him. And I, I cut him in chunks, like eating chunks. And it, if you're cooking a supper for 10 people, it takes 10 pounds of meat. No, no, let me back up. Yeah, 10 pounds of meat. A pound a person. A pound a person. How would y'all cook it? We make some gravies. Uh-huh. We... Just fry it down. I'll fry it down like you do a duck or a squirrel. Just fry it real, real, real brown. This is how I like to cook it. I get a little tasso. Y'all know what tasso is, most of the people. I know what tasso is. It, 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 it's the back end of a pork that has been smoked, marinated with all this good oh, seasoning. Oh, yeah, goodness. Put that in anything. I like to take a little of that and cube it real, real fine. Fry that down with that turtle. It gives it a little smoke flavor. So you're in like one of these big... Uh, big black pot. Big black pot. I'll use a big black pot. Put a little grease in there with your turtle and your uh, and your, and your tasso and start, start frying it down. Fry it down real good until it gets good and brown. Like you do your duck, squirrel, deer meat, anything. Then then when it, then I put, my, I put onions and bell peppers, whatever you want to put. I put onions and bell peppers, celery. Fry it down... I fry my meat down, then I add that just before my turtle's ready. I just fry the whole thing down. Yeah, cook and, it and down. Then I put a little uh, t a little water to make my gravy and, and put whatever seasoning you use. I put I, I put a little roux. You can put instant roux or roux out of a jar or make your own roux. Either way you want to do it. Some people don't put roux. I put a little bit of roux in there. Some people brown gravy is good. I like to put a little tomato sauce just to discolor it. Mm -hmm. Give it a little tint. That's why I like it. Very, very, very good. Me and my partner cooked some over here for some guys. They don't eat that. We cooked. Some, a lot of people haven't eaten it. We had. That, that, that's why I know that. I took uh, 10 pounds, a, a gallon Ziploc bag, a whole 10 pounds dress. And I told my partner, don't invite no more than 10 people. 
Well, he did. We had 10 people, and it was just enough to feed us all. But when they finished eating that, they, the, the one, they had one fellow that said, I'm not, I'm not eating it. And so that, you, you know, whatever you want. He ended up eating two plates. Most of them ate it. They was going to buy hoop nets the next day and fish each other. <laughs> <laughs> I'm telling you the truth. They liked it so much. And, and it just takes two hours to cook. It, just like ducks or squirrel and very good eating. So they take you take that net uh, or take your trap, bait it up with some fish, and just how long would it take for a turtle to get in there sometimes? It takes a couple of days. It They smell under the water. They can smell that. that I've heard that. That all film. But I would leave them on above because if we didn't have alligators, because they can really smell it. And I would say a couple of days. It takes a while to find. What's the biggest turtle you ever caught? The biggest one ever caused 125 pounds of loggerhead. Is that his skull over there in the cabinet? No, I found I found that in the lake when it dried up. Folks, the, 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 these turtle skulls literally are the size of a Folgers can. Probably wouldn't fit in a regular Folgers can. You had to get one of them big plastic ones. Yeah, you found it in the lake. In the year 2000, it had dried up. We was duck hunting, and the water kept, it hadn't rained and it kept dropping and dropping and dropping. That was in January. So I went back, it had dried up completely while I hunt. So I went back in February with my two boys, they was little then, just to look for old decals in front of the blind. And, and my oldest boy said, Dad, there's a big old turtle over here. So I went, look, it was about a 70 pound log ahead. And it hit me. I said, damn, there ought to be more than that. So we dug him up. Not, he was trying, dead or alive? No, no, he was hibernating. It, yeah. It had crawled up in the mud, just waiting it out. Right, but what? The thing about this was they had some big cracks. The clay was on his back. It was hot, and I knew that turtle couldn't survive that long, that hot. It was real hot. So we dug him up. There's a place on our property that never dried up, and we bought him over there. So after that, we went and looked. We found five that one evening. Five big turtles. And they done buried up in the mud. It had dried yep. up and hardened so much they couldn't move. This was from the hibernate now. Because they had, the clay had, you know how you know how you look at the clay bottom is big cracks in the ground? Yeah. This was on top. They had a place just like this for their head sticking up. You could see them. And it was cracked. They were, I'm talking about there was buried a foot on the ground. So we went, we dug up five of them and brought them to safety. And... I went back for two weeks and searched every every part of that prop, that lake bed, and which is very hard because it's full of buttonwoods. Mog, when I'm, let me back up and tell you something. Mog, when I saw that first big turtle, the first thing I thought of was my grandpa. When I right, when I looked at him, he was old and helpless, and probably as old as my grandpa. They lived to be a long time. I've heard they lived to be over hundred years old. But I, when I seen him, I, the first thing that I hit my mind was that he needs help. That's why I did this. And I went with my nephews, their friends. We ended up finding 16 of them. They'd come help me. we spread out. We'd walk. Cool, look, I found a big one. I'd go look, and, and the, whenever you'd find one, that's mostly two or three. They're in the same areas, hibernating. That's what I witnessed. Every now and then we'd find one by itself. We dug every one of them up and bought them where, where they had water. It was about two acres, and it was full of mud eels, fish all over. So I knew they had plenty to eat. After we did this, I went back about a month later. Right in the middle of my wild hunt, there was about a 100-pound one dead. And it, that tells me I saved them. The rest would have died. He couldn't. Yeah. He couldn't find water. It. They didn't get. It didn't fill up back with water for ten months after that. They died. They'd have died. My boy caught one this year, uh, uh, about 130, 140 pounds. Caught and him in a trap. No, he he was swimming on a boat. He caught him by the tail and pulled him in the boat. Yeah, lady. With his mama. His mama freaked out. She didn't know what <laughs> 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 but I guarantee you that's one that we caught 20 years ago. Yeah. We see them time to time. So that I know it, it, you know, we saved them. And it makes me feel good to know we did that. 
But the biggest I caught was 120. That, we weighed them 125. I caught some 110, about five of them over 100 pounds. And uh, how much were you getting a pound for them when you sold them? Oh, that was in the 70s. Uh, I think so. I can't hardly remember. There was a, it was a, it was less than a dollar. Yeah. But I can't remember exact, exact price. I, I would sell them whole. Yeah. Oh I yeah. wouldn't clean them and sell If I clean them, it's going to my freezer. Oh yeah. But a lot of times I had a bunch of them. I just ran away and sell them whole. And, uh, it was less than a dollar. But I'm going to tell you back then, a five, uh, guys was like 50 cents a gallon. Five dollars went. Whatever you oh, made, yeah, it, it sure did. I'm not, I mean, I'm not old like my daddy or the old people, but it's, it's a big difference back then. It didn't cost a lot, so that's all free money, man, to buy shells with and all. When I was a child, catching the smaller ones like that, that that's the way I looked at it. I mean, you yeah, know. I enjoyed doing it. I liked it just to go see what I catch, you know. When you when, you had told me one time you had to change your heart at some point in time and just quit fooling with them old dinosaur turtles when i saw that one that reminded me of my grandpa this it just changed your mind yeah you? i'd kill i used to kill them turtles and man when i catch one 30 50 pounds oh you talk about i couldn't wait to get them home to kill them or if i see one across the road i like to get in the wreck trying to catch them mm -hmm. i don't do that no more i'm i guess age does that but when I seen that big turtle half buried and he was stuck and he looked at me just as size can be, it, 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 it just hit me. He needs help. And, and that's why we, look, we did this for two weeks. We rescued 16 of them. And it's on, it's on, you can look it up on uh, YouTube. Uh, Dale Bartle on catching alligators, snapping turtles in the mud. And you'll see a 10 minute video of that. Now we said a lot of stuff and acted crazy on the film, but that was 20 years ago. But it shows the big turtles we caught, and, and it shows them how they was hibernating and all. Big as Volkswagen, some of them were. I mean, they were massive. I've seen, I've seen, I've seen some pictures you posted up at times. We had the big, big red, we had the big reds back then, loaded down, man, take, run them across the lake, digging them up, bringing them where they had. When we catch one, I'd tie them to the front of that big red, and we'd, I'd bring them across where they had water. We made I don't know how many trips back and forth. The natural history of those snapping turtles. Um, I, I, I tell you this, uh, my youngest son, Duncan, I don't think you've met him yet. He's over in Okinawa right now, but he uh, he caught one one time and brought it home, and it was about the size of a quarter. And, and I believe he probably caught that turtle from the time it hatched out of the egg before it got to water. It was tiny. And we put it in an aquarium. He had all kinds of little, little zoo experiments going on in our garage as a little boy, which is great for him. And um, it grew to be about two pounds. I mean, it, it was pretty sizable over the years. And I would walk out in the garage. It was a big old aquarium by then. I'd walk out in the garage, and that thing would stand up. And as I walked past, it would walk down the glass looking at me. And I'd go get a big handful of dried dog food and put it in there, and he'd gobble it down. And one day, I just said, I wonder how much. Because it was getting on about August, September, so them turtles ought to have been just gorging themselves, get ready to to lay up for the winter, like you say. And just one day I said, I'm going to see how many handfuls of dog food hmm. this turtle ate before it quits. It ate about two pounds of food. And I, and I told Duncan, I said, it's time to let this turtle go. This this turtle don't belong in no cage. You know what I'm saying? Don't, yeah. it, it's time to let this old turtle go and do its thing. But um, as a little boy fooling with those turtles, I can remember uh, when I would catch them, I just had an eye. I was hunting a small little ditch there in Greenville. And I'd, I'd look. It was shallow water. It might be a foot or two. But if you looked in still water, you could see the imprint. Cause what they would do is they would they would sit and they would back themselves back and forth. And they, they finally covered themselves up with mud, but they leave their head out. And how they hunt is they open their mouth. And a little old bitty turtle had got a tiny little old bitty pink tongue. And the fish would swim up to get, get, get the bait. That old, that old long neck would come out and grab him. I, I can't imagine how big or how much food a hundred and something pound turtle would eat. But I have seen them, uh, a much smaller turtle bust a big stick. when when you, you, It's got a business end right there, don't it? Man, you, just, <laughs> you, got some, got some you didn't ever taunt one with a hoe handle or nothing, did you? No. 
uh, well, we we had did National Geographic come and did that video at the camp, and they did a they had a we had a turtle that was two hundred pounds. <clears throat> my friend, my brother, I caught that turtle down in South Louisiana, and they did a uh, they made a <clears throat> a jail hind the consistency of a human hind, and they put that in his mouth. Just to see, he bit that thing Clean in out. two and, and wouldn't spit it out. He held on. No. Just to show that's what would happen to your hand. They put a broomstick in his mouth. He snapped that thing like it was a toothpick. That's probably what happened, what happened to my childhood hero. He was trying to get that turtle in a croaker sack and it caught his thumb. Oh, man. Well, he was hunting. And they say he wasn't hunting with trap. What he would do, I understood, is he'd push pole on the back end of those ox bows early, early in the morning and late at night when they were, they were out hunting and crawling around. And he would... He would judge, he would describe to us, he would judge from the bubbles, the width of the bubbles crawling, uh, which end was the front, which end was the back, and how big they were. And if they were big enough, he had a, a big old long piece of conduit with a hook. He'd tap them on the shell and then reach down and grab that little that little piece of bone right up under the tail. Boom, he'd grab them, lift them up in there. Well, he was so busy making money, he picked his thumb up, put it in his pocket, but by the time he... Got done working and got to the hospital, they couldn't sew it on. Cool. Yeah. You should have gone to the hospital right now. <laughs> well, I guess he could catch him with nine digits quick as he could with with, with, uh, with ten, you know. But uh, I, I just find that very fascinating. That's a big part of uh, South Louisiana culture, in it? Those turtles and, and all this resource down there. Rise, I'm going to tell you something. Uh, I called out the Wolf and Fishers and Lucy, uh, over here to... They're not on that. You still can hunt them in Louisiana. I think it's... Uh, but not like you used to, right? No, you yeah. used to be able to catch one. And right now you can... I mean, I'm sorry, four. Right now you can catch one. <clears throat> but I called and I talked to a fella, not, I ain't going to mention names, that, that who got it changed. And I asked him, why is Texas uh, and Arkansas and I believe Mississippi, you can't catch none? Right. Why are they? Why are they so hardly, heavily harvested in Louisiana, and there's no protection? And you, and all states around us, you can't fish them. <clears throat> Excuse me. Well, he told me when he went to state the capital, that he changed it from four to one a day. He said, "Dale, if you'd have seen the commercial fishermen, plus their senators, it, you know, it, politics." If I, if I would change, I'm scared if I went to take it all off and, and it would go back to four. Yeah. I don't, I'm scared to open a can of worms. And, and I understand what he's saying. They're heavily fish in Louisiana and it's all politics. And now they have turtles. They're not going to catch. But I'm, I got to give it uh, hats off to these people. That's the organizations that are catching these turtles. They have turtle ponds. They're hatching the young. They're raising them and turn them back into the wall. As That's we speak. good. It's all over. I, I have several good friends doing this as we speak. And, and they have videos. I've done it myself. I've hatched a bunch of eggs and raised them till there was about a pound, I guess, and turned a whole bunch loose. And I, I hope they made it. But th this is taking place. Now, these people that's doing this like to eat turtles, but they're conservationists. Just like Ducks Unlimited, right? They, they formed the organization, and I gotta take my hats to off to them. I'm glad to see that. What about alligators, Dale? Because you got some pretty big alligator heads around here too. Is that is that a big part of how you grew up and what you do down here? I mean, yeah. Well, I've been fishing for 34 years now, every year, and while we at while we duck hunt, they're very very plentiful, and I'm hunting them. Is to keep them thinned out, I guess you can say. And even if the pro the price is as bad, like this past year was the worst I've ever seen it. It really didn't pay to fish them, but I had to take some out. And I try to focus on the big ones. And what I mean is, we have some big ones now, but I, I put some bait real hard, like probably four or five feet up. And, and you might think that this fella's crazy, but you're going to eliminate them five and six footers. If them big sonar guns want to eat, they're going to get that high and eat. Oh, yeah. And wow. Uh, that's a big, that's a, how big alligator did it take to reach four foot high up off of water? Oh, uh, about uh, seven, eight foot. 
Last year I had a good, I had about an eight foot average. That's wow. hard. That's a good average. Wow. What's the biggest alligator you ever caught? 13 feet, two inches. How much does a 13 foot, two inch alligator weigh a bunch? This one, this one I caught, I didn't weigh them, but probably 700 pounds. I've caught several, a lot of 11, 11 something, 12, 12 something. One day they had an alligator, he had a hawk, black hog in his mouth swimming. And we was teal hunting. And I set a line, that was a, when that leg dragged up, that I found seven alligator holes, and that was a hole he was in. He turned that hole, whenever we seen him, he had a pig in his mouth. That pig was about 100 pounds. Mm. We took it, we drug it to the bank and pulled it in the woods. He didn't have no horn hams left, the horn legs. He had ate them already. I fished that gator for one week, and he never would bite. So I told my partner, my hunting buddy, David, I bought my seven millimeter, and I told him, I, I put my hip boots, the closest tree to that spot was about 65 yards, I guess. Everybody went teal hunting that morning. We killed out teal, but there's a lot of traffic right there at the camp. So when we came home, I told David, let's go back, just me and you. So he dropped me off at that spot, and he left, and he went back to the camp. As soon as I quit hearing the boat, he had got back. He had just walked in the camp, got him a beer, and I shot that gator that fast. <laughs> yeah. As soon as he left, I was sitting behind a tree in the water, a little sopper's tree, and that gator popped his head up. I waited till his head, he, well, he was like that anyway. He was facing the other way from the hole. And I put the crosshairs, I used the water line for the cro that crosshair, and I shot, pow. And he, and he rolled, he did that dead roll, and they rolled that leg sticks up. Yeah. And I had a walk and talk. I said, David, come get me. I shot him. He said, you're full of crap. I said, I'm telling you. And he knows I don't play around. So he came. I got a big pole and a hook where I can feel, and I hook him. And I felt him off the bat. And I, they float easy when they like that in the water. But anyway, he was 12 foot, 2 inches long. And that pig, that alligator caught about a hundred pound hog. Can you imagine the fight? You know how tough them hogs are? <laughs> oh, yeah. Well, you know, when Forrest and I hunted with you, you just said, you know, we brought our dogs, of course. And you said, no, nah, this ain't the place to run a dog. Y'all don't hunt dogs out no. there, do you? Rhymes, this year and and this year in December and January, I had alligators steal my ducks. I'm telling wow. you. December and January. I fought with one, I lost it, I fought with another one, I got my duck back. But they, now this, I'm talking about seven, eight foot gators. Well, a you're seven pretty quick eight, out there in a the P-Row too. I've seen you fishing ducks with a P-Row. You, you're pretty quick. Yeah, but you can't, I can't run them alligators. <laughs> 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 but I'm going to tell you, I'm talking about seven, eight foot gators. Yeah. That was drawing a dog. Oh, yeah. An alligator will drown a human that big. And what they'll do, they'll, they'll eat pieces and a dog. So you can't trust. I, I don't have dogs. There's too many gators out there. And, and when it warms up in the winter, they're still there, you know. You can't depend on them. They said alligators don't eat in the winter. Well, I'm telling you, whoever told you that's wrong. Because I've seen them eat in December and January. Probably, probably got to do with something, whatever the ambient temperature is. At some point in time, it just kind of shuts them down. They they go and uh, hibernate or whatever like that. But, it, I mean, y'all, it stays pretty warm down here at times. Yeah, well, that's what I'm saying. The mild, When it gets real mild and, and some winter, some days you can hunt with just a long sleeve shirt, that's when they come out and yeah. they will feed. They're not aggressive, but they'll feed, they'll eat on stuff. Yeah, we don't, I don't need my lab getting eaten by an alligator. No, uh, I, and I would feel bad forever if that happened. When we uh, when we opened up the episode, you were blowing on a duck call, and uh, you were telling me about this particular call of yours, why. And I, I just love this kind of stuff incorporated. This is one of your cane calls we talked about last time. What what What's special about this particular rig you got around your neck right now, Dale? Rhymes, I'm going to tell you something. We used to we used to have a camp. It's a place called Red River Bay in the seventies. We hunted there for probably seven years. It was right off the Red River, and I'd hunt with my wood pirogue, the one like you getting. The whole winter, just jump shooting. We had me and David had a little blind, but we would put a trot line. We had a trot line that go across the Red River on the bottom, clean across. 
and then we put it parallel on the other. That we said it, but that's how long the trot line was. My daddy had a trot line from the in the nineteen sixties, and we was using. And they, I'm talking about the seventies, so it's not that far off. Whenever we quit there, I'm very sentimental about it, all these things, and I can show you when we leave here. I put it all in a box. And I, I, I dug out his old trot line. Now this is, hit the old trot line in the 60s was a heavy cotton string. You can see it. Mm -hmm, I can see it. Old time. So I took it, I cut a section off. I just found it a while back, but that is from the 60s. It was here. So I cut a section off and I made me a double lanyard from a duck call, a, a duck call lanyard in memory of him. And I found his old decoy. He gave me his decoys. Because you wrap, just so I can explain to y'all, uh, a lot of these cane calls have wrapping, uh, like string wrapping around the base, I guess to keep it from splitting, or is it decorative? or? No, it was to keep it, a lot of them old calls split. Yeah. And, and then it, that's a whipping knot they would put. That, yep, I see. And, and it, it's just to keep it intact. I'll put that because of the heritage. And also, you can put your lining on it. It, it holds it good. Well, what's special about that wrapping right there, that, that piece of string wrapping you got around this call? This wrapping comes off a decoy my daddy had from the 1980s. And he probably it, killed a couple of ducks over there. He killed a lot of ducks, and I killed some with him over there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but I cut it off. So what I did, I took off the old string I had on his decoys, and I incorporated it into my wrapping on my mm -hmm. cane call, and I used his old trot line from the 1960s. So everything is from him on here. That's it, pretty cool. It, it's a memory decoy, uh, line, you know what I mean? And this is a, uh, this is a single reed duck call that I made. I'm going to hunt with it this year in memory of him. Little stuff like, that's another thing about hunting. You, you get to share your memories in the blonde with them like this. Oh, yeah. I guarantee you, man. We talked about that last yeah. week. It's very important. I like that kind of stuff. Tell me about this old shotgun behind you. Man, this is old gun here. I used to shoot a lot of old guns in the 70s. Listen to this. Listen to how good this sounds. You hear that? I do. Old pump shotgun. Listen, listen to this trigger. That's a hammer. I, you know, I, I, I've never shot I'm a pump sorry. shotgun I mean, that had a hammer that got pushed back when you hammer. shucked it. it. Listen to the pretty noise it make. Pretty Every noise. time I shoot a duck and I pull it back, man, it, it just... But it, it smooth, smooth. What kind this, of... What is that? This is... They made the uh, Winchester's 1897. That's, that was the gun made before the Model 12s. Well, in 1888, Marlin came out with their own version of the Hammer. So this is a Marlin. It's a Marlin. This, is, this one I got was made in 1908. But they started in 19, I'm sorry, 1888. Wow. One year after the 97s. I've never shot these guns because I shot my 870s, but now with ball shells, I'm returning to the blind, bringing them back to the blind, getting them in commission, and I'm having a ball with them, man. I've, I've done the same thing, and uh, Lee Cho, Brandon, and I have talked about this too. You know, a lot of these old safe queens, you, you cannot, cannot, cannot shoot steel shot through. And uh, I grew up shooting lead. I, my, my folks grew up shooting, you know, two and three quarter inch guns. And um, you know what? I, I'm assuming you shot some birds with this 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 gun since boss has been out. But they uh, boss shot shells has just brought this all back in the air. I mean, it's just it's all made it hip, and it's like, man, this, these are incredible guns. And I remember my grandfather. Um, I remember my dad and uncle talking about my grandfather, what a great shot he was. I can remember as a little boy seeing him shooting the dove field. I don't ever remember him missing. I'm sure he did, but I don't remember it much. And as I started shooting uh, recently, these old guns of his and that era of gun, I realized, you know, those old guys were good shots because they shot a lot. But those guns, those guns just threw a better pattern 
I think, than, than unless you do a lot of work on something. You know, just right off the shelf at Walmart, you just ain't going to get that pattern. No, right? no. Especially with steel shot. <laughs> Any steel shot. You just ain't going to get that kind of pattern. Well, that steel shot, if you on the water, it looks like it's slanging all over. Oh, it's got a real coarse pattern. Yeah. It doesn't have the energy when it hits them. That's right. And, and is, is that a, uh, looks to be about a 28 or 30 inch barrel. A definitely a 30. With a full choke, I'm betting. Full bad. choke. Not, not only knock some miles down. We didn't kill a lot of miles this year, but this old baby done a trick, man. You talk about fun. I got an 1897 I used, too. Made in 1916. I use it pretty regularly. I use both of them. Mm -hmm. so, it, I have found myself, uh, I, I've got some old family guns like that, but I find myself prowling around and looking for a few of those old iconic shotguns and I'm not looking for something to put up and keep pretty. I'm looking for a, a gun that's got a history and use. I've got sure. some family guns. Uh, you know, my, my father had, uh, my father and my uncle had a pair of, uh, when they were eight or nine years old, my granddaddy gave them a pair of Model 12, 12 gauges with consecutive serial numbers. And my dad's just, I don't know when he died, we tore the house apart looking. I'm assuming his, his, his wife uh, not my mother, but his wife got rid of it or did something with it, or maybe he sold it. I don't know, but boy, we tore the house apart looking, and I'm, I'm bound and determined to find a gun to replace that because that that was gun uh, before my grandfather gave me that old 1100. That's what I shot. That was yeah. my introduction. That old that gun shot. He he got that gun back in the 50s, and it shot as good in the late 80s as it did in the 50s. I'm telling you, it was just a killing stick. And uh, I've had real, real good luck shooting ball shot shells with these old guns. Oh, really definitely have. so. It, like you said, it brings it brings another meaning to duck hunting. To me, using these old guns, it, it's the same as the old calls. It's like I can picture my dad. I used my dad's Model 12 this year. I hadn't shot. He hadn't shot that gun since 89, whenever the steel came out. I hunted with it this year. I hunted with my, my grandpa died in 1964. I shot his gun this year. Wow. My brother has it because he's the oldest grandchild. Mm -hmm. It's not mine. But uh, mm -hmm. I, I, he bought it and I shot, and I killed ducks with it. And you know the feeling, I shot a duck, when I shot a duck with his old gun, Russ is like killing a 12 point with a rifle. The emotion is just unbelievable. To know he used to, he used to fish, he used to kill Grobecks with that gun. And in, in the 1930s, well, probably the 1930s, 1940s, his neighbor had a little money. My grandpa was poor. He had one arm. And it, he would give my grandpa 10 shells, paper shells. And he had that old gun. And his name was Wee Day for French. Wilbert was his name. He said, Wee Day, I'm going to give you 10 shells. I want five growbacks. The shot you miss is yours. Now, what is a grow back for anybody listening? It's a yellow, it's a night crown hair, yellow crown hair. Yellow crown night hair, yeah. Yeah. The French people in this community were so poor in the Depression, they ate, they, they, it's a summer bird over here. That, and they call uh, the back cross, that's uh, white arbors. That means crooked bill, back cross in French. That's what they call them. I didn't know what that meant. They ate them. They shot them hard and heavy all summer, but they fed the. It was not selling. It was a meaning. Right now, as I got into my, we're talking about generations ago. So I'm, yeah, yeah, yeah that's, that's right. That's the way things were. Yeah, and so, and and the old game wars wouldn't fool with them. They would, you know, they didn't go crazy with it. But my grandpa shot many birds with that old gun. So to use it this past year. It just brought back a lot of memories, and it is, it's a new meaning to duck hunt with these with these shells. I agree. You know, I, I broke out that old side by side gun this year, and then I broke out my my grandfather's Remington 1100 that I'd shot in high school. Thought it'd be my only gun back in the day before steel shot came along. And uh, boy, I put those little two and three quarter inch five balls copper plated in there, and just it shot is good. It shot better than I remember. You know, just a round barrel, and and uh, but I tell you what, Forrest had never seen that gun. I mean, he may have been digging through the safe and seen it, but he ain't never shouldered. He ain't never shot with it. And and you know, everybody knows me, and uh, I travel a lot. And when I go to these far flung countries, I don't bring those old guns. 
you know, because if they break, I'm I'm S O L. They're yeah. old guns. They're they're uh, they're family heirlooms, and they they're. Uh, I shoot Benelli because it does what it's supposed to do, and I can make it run, and it it's reliable. I mean, you know, when you're 6,800 miles from home, reliability matters most. Oh, but beef. to break out these guns in my old stomping grounds, and 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 it's like uh, I never really thought I wanted Forrest to see it and carry on, but he posted a picture on social media later, and and you know. That was my granddaddy's gun. Well, that was his great granddaddy's gun, and it all of a sudden took on a whole new meaning when he saw ducks die. Right. It, 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 it took on a whole new meaning about who he is. Sure, you know. And the little time I spent with Forrest, he looks like he's very sentimental. He is. And I think, I, and then with a little age, I think he's going to go that route, which is a very good way to go, man. He is. We we got to. I, I I said it last issue. I'll say it again. You know, the the future of hunting lies in its past. You know, we are, we are accumulation of our of our past. Exactly. You know, and to be able to connect to future generations. I mean, you know, anybody listening, I'm sure if they've got kids, they're introducing their children to hunting, and you were introduced to hunting by your father or your grandfather, who was introduced to hunting by their family, and it just it's just it's something that just a gift that keeps on giving. You know? Exactly. I like that old shotgun, Dale. We, we need to, next time I hunt with you, we, we you bring that shotgun, I'm going to bring one of my old Yeah. Ones. I'll bring some of my decoys, you bring some of yours, and we'll just have us a real old school hunt. You talk, I'll hunt like that as often as I can. That's kind of a tradition. Speaking of which, that is kind of a, a tradition. I, I have seen uh, on the internet, I have seen... I guess it's your opening weekend, kind of a ceremonious event for you. Yeah, I do. I, I got my old overalls I wear for a day old. And not not mostly my handmade decors. When the season opens, I, I, I have all these people I bring. So I use my regular decors. Then when it starts mellowing out and I see what, I have several places to hunt, rings in the woods, fields. Me and my me and my boys are with bar sales or by myself. That's when I slip off and, and hunt my old decoy. I pretty much use my cane calls pretty often. You know. You use your cane calls every time I've seen you. Yeah, every, uh, all the time. And I use my body beast calls, but the, the, the older I get, the more I'm using it's this is more traditional call. I'm using it pretty much, but But I've seen where you go out and and you run the lanterns. You oh, run yeah, over so. your handmade decoys out of your homemade P row, push them with your homemade paddles or your push pole there. Oh, everything. I, I, I hunt with that old boat last year all the time, mostly. Yeah, I, I leave it at the camp. That's what I built it for. And if it something happens, I build another one, I guess. I, I'm going I'm to keep going the old way. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but, but these guns add to it. When I'm piling that old dugout, it really. Looking at this sitting in the front just makes it it seals the deal. It makes the hunt so much special. And uh, the old blind, the like blind those? we hunted out of. Yeah, I noticed. I noticed. I noticed. Uh, Let me tell you something about that. We used to hunt in years ago in the seventies, eighties, and through the nineties. People made big parliament blinds in the open. I'm talking about six foot wide, 16 feet long, where you can put a whole boat in and you had a shooting deck. Right. That was all over Louisiana. I've, I've been in those blinds, yep. Now, that was good, but times changed. Can't kill ducks no more like that. We had a hard time in the 80s killing ducks. Christmas on. They see that object. And we used to use all willow. All willow for years. So what I, I went, what you brush it up with willow or you plant willows by? No, we just go cut willow and, and just brush it. You know, we put a, a rope. But you get back and look at that, and you know yourself, that doesn't match wild mm -hmm. hunt. Wild mm -hmm. hunt is all buttonwoods and uh, cypress. Sticks out. So what I started doing, and I learned this from an old fella too. You learn a lot from these old people. I started using oak limbs. You can use any kind of oak limbs. I cut my limbs August, uh, November the 1st, the, just before frost. Duck season here opens about the 17th, around that time of the month. But uh, the 1st of November, I cut them, I put them on, 
Then I'll go pick moss all over. And I put moss and I put vines. I got I got some vines now stored that I clean up a fence row. Last year I had three. Every time I, I'm looking for that all over. If I see some in the ditch, I'll pick it up. Vines is the most camouflage, natural camouflage, in my opinion, that you can put on a blonde in the field, a blonde or a hunt, anywhere. A duck's a nice scatter of vines. Well, I know, I've noticed, too, that you uh, you use a lot of Spanish moss. Russ, I, I moss that tree down I'm hunting next to. I put my blonde against a tree. That's another thing. Oh, you're right up next to that cypress tree. Then I'm, I, I add moss to that tree. I come across my blind, then up to the next cypress tree. So you're looking at 20, 30 feet of moss. That is going to, you can't spot that blind. You know what I'm saying? No, that, I, blind, that blind, you're looking at a 12-foot blind, but you got 30 feet of moss across. It's a game changer to them ducks. They don't know it's a blind right there. Everything looks too natural. Well, that's that's the number one thing. It, it, it blend in. So we're killing ducks now to... This year, the last weekend, me and David killed 12 ducks. You swore the opening day. We had six regions, and, and the rest was gray ducks and whatever, teals and all. Is that mostly the species y'all shoot there? Is, is gadwall and widgeon? Probably eight, probably 70% is gray ducks. Maybe 60. Then a lot of teal, not many regions. This year, we had a lot of regions for some reason. We killed about the five times we normally kill. We, there was the all winter this year. The mileage is not many miles no more. It gets less and less, it looks like. But uh, you might, we kill like a, a seven species in a hunt. And if you want to shoot rainnecks and spoonbills, you know, we have plenty of them <laughs> variety. Yeah. But You know me and Forrest, we're going to shoot oh, one. Oh, man. Yeah, we're going to shoot one if it comes over the decoys. My boy's the same way, but last year we, they wanted to shoot. They were slow. I said, don't be shooting that. They killed two. We ended up killing 18 ducks. And we had two spoon bills, and I said, "You see why I don't shoot them?" Uh huh. You could have you could have had all good ducks. I, that's why I don't shoot them. Yeah. As far as eating them, well, I ate them all my life. There's nothing wrong with them when they're pretty, when they're white colored and all. Yeah. But uh, yeah, that blind concealment, and I tell you something else I learned. Well, I was, I was going to ask you this too. I noticed your tradition. You've been hunting there three decades. Been hunting there thirty. I think it'd be thirty-four years this year. And and I noticed like your brothers. Each have their blind. It's like y'all are a camp. You're a family camp, three, 30, 40 years old. But you, that's your blind. That's my blind, and yeah. your brother, we passed by your brother's blind. He got that blind over there, and your other brother's got a blind over yonder. Well, my little nephew has a blind now, but when I'm not hunting, or, or I bring my nephews and his kids, you know, I love to hunt with them. We hunt each other's blinds. If they want to, if I'm not there, if I, even if I'm there, it, we hunt with but you know, every like opening weekend, you hunt your blinds. You have these certain blinds, but uh, who's his best? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> they're all good. They're all good. They're different ways. Yeah, but uh, I just put you on the spot in case one of your brothers is listening. I like. Oh, they're that. good hunters now. Oh, they are. But I'm gonna tell you something that I do. I, I we been. To, they, I got me an old soccer stump blind. You made like a softest trunk out of. Uh, I hadn't seen that in yet. Out of softest lights. It's like three feet diameter. And I got it on a little, it's an eight by eight floating dock I put. or Was it up in the softest? It's in the. It, it, it's in the woods? It's on the edge of the woods. And what I'm trying to say is it's about 150 yards from my big blind. It's a one man blind. Warm us are going out with a Piro. You know how them ducks start skirting them blinds? Oh, yeah. And you put, say you got 50 decoys, you put six, about 100 yards, you get all the action, that's what it's for. And you talk about kill some ducks. Stale duck. Well, describe this blind to me. So uh, I think I know, because I know like, like uh, it's part of the world where you got a lot of cypress. And I mean, once you turn off 20 head south in Louisiana, Everywhere you look, there's a cypress tree on a, on a bow somewhere and up in these breaks. And, I'm like, yeah. But, but, but when they get real, real old, they, they I mean, it might just be a big old stump. And we're talking about big stump. Yeah. Uh, some of them cypress were cut from the 1900s when they cut all this lumber and they just holler. Just, you see right. it all over, especially in the basin. 
A duck is not scared of a stump. Not scared of a dead tree, not scared of a stump. So I, I built this blind, it's, it's like three feet diameter out of cypress boards. It's on my Bayou Beast page if you look at it, good on it. And I got a door in the back, a double swinging door. You get, it's on a floating pontoons. And I put vine, water lilies and vines hanging where it looks like a floating mat. And I put vines on my cypress stump just hanging. And man, you talk about, you can't tell it's there. Them ducks will come land right there 10 feet from you. And it's made out of just pieces of cypress? Yeah, I took, I made a frame out of two by four, treated wood, an optical frame. It's got probably nine, I think it's nine, nine different contours. Yeah. And I, 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 I beveled my uh, wood, I degreed it where it butts up, you can't see a seam in it. It looks like a trunk. Yeah. And with a table saw, the sawbush boards, I got, and you, it's a one man deal, but it, it's very productive. My blonde's good for salt wind. When it's a big north wind, they like to land on that side of the lake. So you, when you go in there in a big north wind, it's it's a... The, last year, my boy, I heard ping, pow, ping, pow. You can already see good. He called me down. I killed my six. And we, I have, we, I leave the, I leave a p rogue over there. And he just come on out and I jump in it and I go shoot my six. We're rotating in it. Wow. Well, I'm going to tell you like this. If you kill it, if, if you try to kill 18, 24 ducks in a blind, to me, if you had some small blind, it, you split up, you could do a lot better. Right. And and we we find we kill more ducks that way. And I'm fixing to build me another one pretty soon to put in a in a cove. I'm spraying right now for water lilies. going to be productive. Yep. Well, Dale, I appreciate your time. I sure enjoyed visiting with you, and I, I want to have you get back on here again. Ah, uh, it's a pleasure, pleasure talking with you. And I'm glad to be part of this. Tell tell anybody listening how how uh, how can they connect with you? Your web page, your social media, because you got a great uh, social media feed. I I follow you religiously. I'm uh, Bayou Beast Calls. I got a page on Facebook, and, and if you want a duck call, if you want to talk, my number's on there, and you get all the inf information. Bayou Beast Calls. Bayou Beast Calls. And I've, I've got some of your cane calls, and I know plenty of folks have got some of your cane calls. What's the what's the waiting time on a cane call? Well, it's probably about a year and a half, uh, or a good year to year and a half. I hate to say it, but the reason why, it's all by hand. I don't have machinery, and I chose, I choose not to have it to keep it as authentic as possible. Yeah. Nothing mechanical. I mean, there's I don't nothing have, electricity. Just all handmade the old way. And I'm going to tell you this. The other weekend was a Sunday. I tried. I made two sound boards. It took me three hours, and they, neither one of them was any good. I had a wasted afternoon. That's what I'm saying. It's not. It's a lot of work goes through it. Most of the time, I can do a sound. This is all behind. It's hard to make a sound board behind and sound like a duck. Most of the time, I could do it pretty good, but I had a bad day. So there's a lot that it, <laughs> it's a lot that goes into it, you know. But uh, Cause you're, I mean, to get to this is for the folks remind you, cause I've seen this process last little bit. You you start with a piece of cedar stump, you pull off a river, you chop it down into smaller pieces. I've seen you out there hatchet and uh, with your little hand hatchet, like you like you chopping stove wood. Once you get it down to there, you start whittling, then you run it through your your, your pattern for the for the round different holes. Got a pl a pl then you lay it on. Then you then you lay it on and start filing it. Right on your pat on your jig. It's a long process. Yeah, it's a, uh, hundred percent so, hole made, just like them old timers you grew up with. All all by hand. I don't have. I could get it late tomorrow. I don't look into it, but might not take all. It, I'd be cheating my ancestors doing that. That's, That's right. I look at it. So the reason why I have a lot of people, about four hundred people, have a list. And it's just going to take a while. And I want to thank everybody that wants a call. And I'm very appreciated by it. I thank you all so much. But I'll get to every one of y'all in time. It just takes a while. It's, it's a slow process. You've been listening to Mr. Dale Bordelin, Bio Beast Calls of Voles Parish, Louisiana. Thank you all for listening to Duck Season Somewhere. See you next time. Mm -hmm.